I can read in the instructions first before we start. Okay. Could we have your attention, please? Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, calling to order the Local Agency Formation Commission, uh, January 25th at 5.15. And Mr. Knox, would you please um, provide instructions for the in-person and video conference protocols? Right, thank you. Uh, welcome to Recording in progress. Not yet. You wait till Recording after. stopped. There we go. Started. No. We, we, we do this before we start. Uh, welcome to the Kern Lafco Commission's first meeting of 2023. I'd like to start by thanking Commissioner Fowler for serving as chair for the last year. Uh, today starts Commissioner Sanders' reign as chair for 2023. Long live the chair. There are a couple of notes regarding how the meeting is held both in person and by video conference. Here are some helpful tips for running the meeting smoothly. For our guests who are in the room, if you want to speak on any item, please go to the, to the podium and speak into the microphone. Otherwise, those online won't be able to hear you and we won't be able to record you and have a record of what, what you said. So that would be helpful. Uh, for those attending by video conference, uh, your microphone is muted until the chair recognizes you. Um, please use the raise hand function in Zoom to be recognized for an item that you want to speak on. The raise hand function is different in different places depending on your version and device you're using to participate. Mr. Rice is host in charge of the Zoom portion of the meeting. If anyone gets disruptive, Mr. Rice can throw them out. Uh, not physically, just out of Zoom. <laughs> or if anyone needs to recuse himself, Mr. Rice can place them in the waiting room and bring them back out again when the agenda item is completed. Uh, when a commissioner makes a motion, please state your name and your motion. The chair will repeat the person's name and motion. Uh, as we have a new chair, this will be very helpful. Uh, all votes will be roll call votes. Uh, commissioners on Zoom, please make sure you are unmuted when you vote as we are recording and need to hear your response. Thank you for everyone working with us. Now please start the video and I'll turn it back to the chair to start the meeting. Recording in progress. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Knox. Patty, will you please uh, do the roll call? Here. Commissioner Fowler. Here. Commissioner McKibben. Here. Commissioner Sanders. Here. Commissioner Scribner. Commissioner Saragoza. Here. Representative for City of Bakersfield. Roll call complete. Thank you, Patty. Let's all please stand for the Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Crump, would you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. This is Saul Ayon. I don't know if they heard me. Okay. So moving on to number three, teleconference meeting requirements, uh, discussion and possible minute action, meeting protocol, a motion to hold the board meeting by teleconference pursuant to Assembly Bill 361 and Government Code Section 54953E and finding that there is a proclaimed state of emergency and local officials have recommended measures to promote social distancing, all as required by AB 361 and Section 54953E. Um, Mr. Knox? Oh. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I have to get myself going here. That's okay. All right. We're moving on to number four for the approval of the minutes. No, we're not done yet. Oh, we're not? No. I, I've got a couple things to say, and there's actually a vote on this one. Okay. Uh, at the December meeting, the commission approved the use of AB 2449 to hold meetings both in person and virtually. So you might be asking why we're still meeting this month under the old emergency method under AB 361. There are additional requirements to AB 2449 that were not shared with the commission. 
that requires findings of just cause or an emergency for commissioners to at attend virtually. Mr. Sh Schroeder will re explain the requirements now, but it did not seem appropriate to hold the meeting under the new requirements without commissioners having full knowledge of the process. Mr. Schroeder, can you please share a bit about AB 2449, the requirements for commissioners to attend meetings virtually? One of the reasons we didn't hold it this time is because it's not in effect yet. It becomes in effect at the end of uh, February, um, although you could, you could do it if you wanted to. Uh, the, the differences between what we're doing now and what we're going to have to start doing if you want to do it remotely, and I guess you do, um, when that law goes into effect, is that people cannot uh, join virtually unless there's a quorum of persons in person in the location where the meeting is being held. Um, the, uh, and and the, the way that you can um, join virtually is much more complicated. You can only do it for just cause or for emergencies. And you've got to notify the, the uh, you've got to notify LAFCO ahead of time why you're not going to be here and, and the commission then needs to approve that virtual appearance. Uh, just, just, for, uh, just to give you an idea of what just cause means, uh, if, if you have a child care situation or a family caregiving situation where you need to take care of the child or the family member, um, if you have a contagious disease, uh, if you have a physical or mental disability as defined by statute, and we can get into that, but I'm not prepared to get into what the statutory per, per, uh, uh, reasons are for that. Uh, or if you're on, on, on traveling on official business and you need to, uh, you want to join the meeting, you would need to do it remotely. As far as an emergency circumstance goes, it's a physical or family medical emergency. And again, the commission will be the, the arbiter of whether or not you, you qualify in that particular uh, circumstance. You can only remotely appear twice in a calendar year. Um, ju it, just for curiosity purposes, if any of you on the East in East Kern think that, you know, it would be helpful to have this, you, you just distance and uh, the time of travel does, is not a, a basis for joining virtually. Um, those appearing virtually have to uh, participate through both audio and visual technology. I suppose we have all of that. We do. Um, public uh, members also need to, uh, are able to uh, um, appear virtually, uh, but they have to have available to them an audio, a two-way audio visual platform or a two-way telephonic service and a live webcasting. I don't know if we, we have that. We have all that. So you have most of the uh, technology needed to participate this way. Uh, I guess the big thing is um, the just cause issue. If someone doesn't fit within just cause and, but still wants to uh, appear virtually, um, they wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, they might want to check ahead with um, Brett Blair as to whether he thinks the just cause that they have in mind will allow them to do that. It would be a shame for them to phone in at the last minute and you not approve the just cause. They could still participate in the meeting as any public member could. They just can't vote in that situation. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Sure. Um, Mr. Schroeder. What is the time frame by which they must notify LAFCO? Right up to the start of the meeting. Okay. It would be best to do it ahead of time so that we can adjust, we can find out if we're going to have a quorum or not. Thank you. A uh, follow-up question. Uh, <clears throat> who actually approves the uh, request for uh, allowing the remote? Is it a... Could you speak into your point? The question is, you said the commission needs to approve the request for a remote uh, virtual um, yes. member uh, being, being present. Well, who at the commission actually does that? The commission. There's a vote. Oh, there's a vote. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a vote on the day of the meeting. If Yes, yes. Oh, okay. <coughs> I appreciate that clarification. Yeah. Yeah. So do we have to have an item on the agenda every no. month? No, that's an item that is not does not have to be on the agenda to be 
brought before the commission. Okay. Another question is how many meetings can a commissioner attend virtually in a year? Two. Yeah. So you can't do this quite not quite often. No. Yes. Another question, but I'll let Barbara. Madam Chairman, thank you. I know it's hard to get into the heads of our state legislators, but why the tightening of this? This seems excessive to me. Well, it's a, it's a major departure from the Brown Act. Uh, it's also a major departure from the pandemic uh, uh, virtual meetings they've allowed. But I think there was, I don't know, I think there was an attempt to get back to the original Brown Act, maybe reduce the amount of virtual appearances so that people had to be at the at the meeting like usual uh, but I don't know I don't know what happens if we get to the meeting and we do not have a quorum in person the meeting stops or never starts or if and you lose a quorum in the middle of the meeting you stop so or if the technology breaks down so you if, have to stop. if it's because we have too many virtually and one drops off we now have a quorum you know, don't have a quorum, you mean? I don't know. Well, you did, if one dropped off virtually and you oh. don't have enough people in the room. Mm -hmm. No, you gotta have a quorum here in person. Okay. You know, you gotta but have at least five people here in person. But if we only have seven commissioners show up, four is a quorum. No, uh, well, that's a good question. I'm, I'm assuming they mean a quorum of the governing body, the entire governing body. Can we clarify that? Well, I'll, I'll try to clarify that. <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Schroeder, would you like to clarify that? Well, that's as much as I can tell you right now. Okay. In, in my opinion, you gotta have five of you here at least to do the- To uh, constitute a quorum. Yes, yes. Okay. Otherwise, but I'm gonna look into his question, see if there's some, some issue there that okay. I didn't pick up on. Okay, yes. Madam Chairman, thank you. So that would be the first item after you give us the rules for uh, the Brown Act and so on. That would be the first item on the agenda mm -hmm. after roll call. If there are people wanting to attend virtually, yeah. Thank you. And, and they have to explain why, what the just cause is. They can't just say child care. They have to give you a little more explanation. <clears throat> so to wrap this up, uh, you might be asking why staff asked you to submit whether you are attending in person or not, even though we're not using a new process to, tonight. It's a trial run. It helps staff work out the kinks and allow commissioners to get used to the process. Uh, not to throw anyone under the bus, but we do have commissioners who are not great at informing us of their attendance. Uh, that has to change in order for the new process to work. Tonight we have five attending, which works, but if we had four, this could really be a problem. Uh, with that, my recommendation is approved finding of a state of emergency and local official having recommended measures to promote social distancing as required by uh, AB 361. Okay. Is there any public comment on this particular agenda item? No. Patty, are there any online who wishes to speak? No. No, okay. Any other commission questions or comments? I make a motion to find the bill for emergency. Okay. Commissioner Crump. Can I have a second? Second, Sour. McKibben. Okay, so we have a motion by Commissioner Crump and a second by Gary McKibben. Patty, can you do a roll call? Commissioner Ayon. Commissioner Aye. Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Yes. Commissioner Sargoza? Yes. Aye. All ayes, motion. <coughs> okay. Okay, now we will move on to the approval of the minutes. Um, we will be looking at the December 7th, 2022 minutes. Are there any Questions or comments, changes? Hi, um, Commissioner Zaragoz had a quick question for staff. Um, I believe at the last meeting, I uh, saw a really neat PowerPoint slide that you were giving a presentation on. It was on the miscellaneous items, um, general business. 
it wasn't in our packet, so I think I, I asked for a copy. It had to do with yearly statistics, and you talked about some of the things you were uh, involved with, the proceedings and commissions uh, requirements that were instituted by LAFCO and those items that were outside LAFCO. And I'm not sure if it was a spreadsheet or just a table, and I just requested a copy of that for my files. Have, have you submitted that to me yet? I haven't seen it. I have not. I did, but oh, if you yeah. haven't received it, I'll resend it. I appreciate that. Oh, then. Yeah. Okay. If you could do that by yeah. by next week, I'd really appreciate yeah. it. That was my only comment. Thank you. Maybe Thank you. before the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> he is magic after all. Okay, so we need a motion and second to approve the minutes. This is motion it. to approve, McKibben. Okay. Motion to second motion motion to approve by Zaragoza. Okay, we have a motion from Mr. McKibben and a second by Mr. Zaragoza to approve the minutes. Any other questions or comments? Patty? Commissioner Ayon? Aye. Commissioner Yes. 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 Thank you. Moving on to item five under public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons desiring to address the commission on any matter not on this agenda and over which the commission has jurisdiction. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record before making your presentation. Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Knox, we have a determination proceeding that we, no? do, we do not. We do not. Okay. And we have no notice to public hearings either. We, we do not. So moving on to commission items, uh, policy and budget committee assignments. Yes. The chair and the executive officer have met and determined the policy and budget uh, committee assignments. The policy committees will be Commissioners Couch, Sanders, uh, a representative from the city of Bakersfield, and Zaragoza. The budget committee will be made up of Commissioners Scribner, McKibben, Ione, and Fowler. Um, the, the chair had one additional um, recommendation. Would you like to yes. announce that? Yes. So I have a suggestion. Um, as a commission, we have a number of um, alternates who serve at the pleasure of the commission should someone a regular commission member not be able to attend we can call on an alternate commissioner to take their place um, this may come in handy if we have a quorum problem but i feel like that um, rather than excluding commissioners from serving on uh, either the policy committee or the budget committee i have asked mr crump if he would serve as an alternate for both committees so in the case of a policy or budget committee member not being able to um, attend, Mr. Crump has indicated that he would be willing to serve as alternate for both, both of the committees. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, committees can only have four commissioners on each. Uh, and as you just mentioned. Um, Mr. Mr. Knox, I've got a question. Yes, sir. Mr. If, uh, if you don't mind. On these, on these committees is, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. For an alternate to be in any of these committees, wouldn't that be a violation of the Brown Act to have an alternate? And the only reason I ask is because that was presented to me in, the, in the, one of our meetings. I, I will allow counsel to answer that. Well, as I understand the chair's proposal, he would only serve if if someone else is not able to. So that you would not have you would not have a, a, a breach of the Brown Act. <laughs> So as long as we only have four attending, it's not a quorum of the commission itself. Right. Uh, so as long as one is missing, the, that person could fill in. Correct. Could I address that? The reason why I wanted to have an alternate is because some of us live in Eastern Kern County, and to not be able to come to Bakersfield would leave a space. And even though Mr. Crump also lives a distance, he might be more available to serve as an alternate on a committee meeting time okay okay no i mean that's that's a that's an excellent recommendation the only reason i ask is because i had the same recommendation for our uh, our meeting and i was told it was a violation of the brown act but i just want to make sure that i was asking that question for clarification thank you 
Um, at this point, I need to stop and, and publicly apologize and thank Commissioner Crump. I did a poor job of reaching out and discussing how these committees are structured and the reasoning behind the selections which left him off one of either of the committees. Commissioner Crump, I appreciate your pointing out my missteps and I will learn from this and be a better executive officer because of your guidance. Thank you. Uh, there is no recommendation and no vote required as these appointments are at the pleasure of the chair. I will turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Okay, moving on to um, item number nine, general business. We do have two monthly expense lists uh, that we need to address and we will take them one at a time. The first one being the uh, approval of the monthly expense list number 2211, that would be for November of 2022. Are there any commissioner comments or questions? Seeing none, I need a motion, a uh, motion and a second. Commissioner Crump, make a motion to approve. Fowler, second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Crump to approve and a second by Commissioner Fowler. Patty, will you make call the roll? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner McKibben? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Saragoza? Aye. Commissioner Arion? Chair, if they didn't hear me, I voted aye. I can't hear um, our, our clerk, so. All ayes, motion passed. Thank you. Okay, and now we need to um, review and approve the monthly expense list for December of 2022, list number 22-12. Any commission comment or questions? Seeing none, need a motion and a second on that. Motion. Second, McKibben. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Fowler and a second by Commissioner McKibben. Patty? Aye. Commissioner Crump? Yes. Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner McKibben? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Saragoza? Aye. All ayes, motion passed. Thank you. Okay, now moving on to item number C, the 2021-2022 audit. Mr. Knox? Yes, I'm requesting that we continue this item uh, there are some discrepancies in the audit itself that we are having discussions with the auditor over. Um, they were not, not able also not to be able to be here tonight. So it makes more sense to make those corrections. Have you have the, the accurate information in your packet so for you to read before you ever get here and then have them explain what the issues are at the next meeting. Do we have any objections to continuing this until the February meeting? No? Okay, we'll continue that then. Do we need a vote to continue? We do not. Okay. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Okay, moving on to D, uh, request to modify the 2023 commission schedule. Uh, the city of Bakerf Bakersfield requests modification of LAFCO, LAFCO meeting schedule for 2023. Uh, Mr. Knox. Yes. The day after the December commission meeting, Com Bakersfield Assistant City Man Manager Helen came to me with a problem. The City of Bakersfield has changed their meeting dates from the first and third Wednesday of the month to the second and fourth Wednesday, conflicting with our regular meeting schedule on the fourth Wednesday of the month. Mr. Helen asked if there was a possibility of changing LAFCO meeting dates. I informed him he is welcome to make the request to the commission. So I present Mr. Helen to make his case. <clears throat> So obviously, uh, it's this, there we go. I guess I just need to eat it. Um, <laughs> uh, obviously, you, you don't have a representative on your commission tonight uh, because there is a, a direct conflict with our city council schedule and LAFCO schedule. Um, I, I did propose uh, to uh, Mr. Knox uh, some alternative dates 
that um, would allow our uh, city council representative, who the city council did uh, approve uh, who would represent uh, the city, which will be uh, Vice Mayor Andre Gonzalez on LAFCO's board. So you can add that to uh, your list of, of future commissioner members. Um, but I, I would just say that those two options that I presented to Mr. Knox in a memo are just ideas. Um, I'd like to see if we can come to an agreement on, on a date that does not conflict uh, with the city council. Um, and primarily because the city council is elected to represent the city and that's their primary responsibility. Not saying that this is any less of a responsibility, but is their primary responsibility to sit at that dais on the second and uh, fourth Wednesdays, so. Okay. There are no re legal requirements that LAFCO, LAFCO, LAFCO has to meet on the fourth Wednesday. In the packet, I include dates that I was aware of that are of conflict for several commissioners. Um, for other meetings that you are required to, uh, but I do not know other meetings that you're required to attend. We have also looked at Kern Cog's schedule to make sure we can schedule the room I expect there will be uh, considerably more commissioner conflicts as I do not know your full schedules. Uh, I've already received a few conflicting dates uh, from Mr. Schroeder, and we've now put a, a calendar up on the wall of dates that are already have conflicts. Um, if, the, if the commission is interested in accommodating Mr. Helen's request, uh, we create a sample calendar and we can place on a screen now. You can let us know if you, there are additional conflicting dates. Uh, we can mark them off and see what might be, able, be available. Uh, without knowing each commissioner's individual schedules or willingness to change the meeting dates at all, a recommendation is not feasible at this time. Okay. So for, for the chair, I think now's the time to ask if there's any additional conflicts or if any of these dates do not work. Firstly, is there any other public comment regarding the proposed um, or the request from the city of Bakersfield? Okay, seeing none. Okay, commissioners. Yes, Ms. Fowler. For how many years have, has LAFCO been meeting on the Wednesday, the fourth Wednesday? I know of six. Um. <laughs> Back to 1990. And I noticed in the past, apparently we've had cl conflicts before because I've been seated next to a city representative who's scooted out or scooted in. Uh, and I don't know how well it worked, but it, we did it, or they did it. Just, just a comment. Thank you. Uh, Looking at the calendar, the second Thursday, I have other meetings I have to attend. Okay. That leaves the third, really the third Wednesday. Alternatively, one of the suggestions that Mr. Howland made was to uh, continue to meet on the fourth Wednesday, but move the meeting time to noon. And I had a discussion with Mr. Knox about that, and he pointed out to me that I work. Gee whiz, he's right, I do. <laughs> however, however, I'm in a position that I have a schedule called Multiflex, and um, as I said to Blair, it would be no skin off of my teeth to utilize that Multiflex schedule that I have, and I'm just offering that up as an alternative. Um, I have to come to Bakersfield anyway. I leave work early anyway. I don't know how any of the other commissioners feel about that. Commissioner Crump is shaking his head like, I got work to do. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, it was, it was just, a, just something that I was offering up. So, so evening still, I think, would be appropriate. Well, I do too, but I'm just, you know, you don't have the multiplex. Okay, all right. 
Um, so Commissioner Fowler is asking if we have heard from the supervisors, and I think the contention with the supervisors is that we don't want to choose either of their meeting days, which happens to be the uh, second and fourth Tuesday, because they're not going to want to come to a meeting in the evening after having been in meetings all day. Correct. So that's, you know, that's a fair, fair thing. I have a question or two. Sure, go ahead. Um, um, it's an interesting uh, request. I think the city of Bakersfield should be present at these meetings, so obviously it's an important, important item to be considered. Kind of a rookie question. Does it have to be determined tonight? The longer this goes, the longer a okay. city of Bakersfield cannot attend. And, and I'm glad I heard some comments regarding perhaps what the uh, the two missing supervisors might have as far as feedback. Um, I just want to make sure they're involved in this process since they normally attend. They And they have multiple meetings with multiple agencies. I, I don't know which which – Mm -hmm. agencies that Commissioner Couch is on I know he's on the air district but I don't mm -hmm. I didn't go as far as to figure out well the air district board is this day because I just okay. wasn't gonna go that far and I, I actually expect them both to you, be you have a very difficult challenge here Blair. <laughs> so right <laughs> so I think I think I, I, I want to just go on, on record I'm okay with the third Wednesday of the month if we're gonna make a change I kind of like the fourth as of today I mean this is it's kind of already set in my calendar, and I rearranged my calendar for the year to be free. I'd have to rearrange my calendar again, but it is doable. I'm going to ask another question. Uh, as much as I would like to have a, a working lunch meeting, I sometimes prefer to have a lunch <laughs> and not have to have a working lunch meeting, so I'm not all that keen on lunch, but you know, worst case scenario, I'd be open to it. I would join Karen in that but I think that might be difficult for other folks. Rookie question it has something to do with uh, our previous discussion on uh, alternates. Is there, and this is either a policy question or a legal question, does the alternate from the city have to be a city council member or can it be a department head? It's up to the city, but I think it's gotta be, I, I think it has to be a uh, council member. I think that's the way the statute reads. Are you sure? No, I'm not. It could it could simply say representative from the city. I don't recall. And if that is the case, a delegated representative, assuming it was the case, would the city be open to keeping the fourth and looking at designating a trusted department head to attend these meetings who do not, their presence would not be required at a city council meeting. It could be like the planning director or development services director or assistant planning director, you have deep, deep pockets when it comes to staff. <laughs> and and that's, that's just a question, kind of thinking outside the box, just trying to see where we can go with this. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Helm. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Zaragoza. So along with making uh, a determination on who is the representative from city council, city council also has another city council member who's the alternate. So that is, as uh, your council advised, the way that this was uh, adopted. And I think that's part of our charter, that it cannot be a uh, staff. It has to be a, an elected representative. And, and Are and you I, sure on that? Yeah, I, I will double check okay. that it's part of the charter. But I can tell you they adopted the, the who is the uh, representative of LAFCO and then who is the alternate. So that's no matter, how it, no matter how it reads, it would be up to the city if they want to appoint a council member. Right. Right. Which, it, if it's a charter amendment, that has to go to the vote of the people. So that would also take a, a great deal well, of time to uh, work out. Let's, let's well. further discuss that. If it is not in the charter and the adoption is a adoption, could you go back out to reconsider the adoption to amend it, <clears throat> to designate a alternate member who is not a city council member is that something yeah, that would be a, a city council decision which i am not a city council member to in, to right. uh, inform you on that decision but it's not out of the question for them to at least consider it yes. if if everything kind of was a green light right i think mr knox has an answer i have an answer 
Uh, the composition of Kern County in the Cortese Knox Hertzburg says the eighth member shall, notwithstanding division of section blah blah blah, be a member of the legislative body of the city in the county having the largest population appointed by the legislative body of that city. So it has to be a legislative member, council a council member. Thank you, Mr. Blair. I mean, Blair Knox. Okay, we've answered the question. Okay. Thanks, appreciate it. <laughs> if I could just add, I, I would, re I mean, because this is the uh, the vice mayor who also has a very active role on city council nights. <laughs> I don't think asking him to play both on that night is um, a fair ask of our vice mayor to play both those roles. So I would just, uh, I, I love the discussion of trying to find an alternative that works. So if we can, um, I, I would again just plead before your <laughs> your commission to, to I find agree alternative. with that sentiment yeah. thank you may I make a suggestion yes please mm -hmm. it looks like the third Thursday is probably the most logical third Wednesday sorry third Wednesday we could make a commission could make a recommendation for the third Wednesday conditional on a, on there not be a conflict with the board two board of supervisors Okay. Do the so. I would go to Commissioner Couch and Scribner and say, "This was the discussion. Here's the date that's open that's being recommended. Do you have a problem? If they have a problem, we come back next month and we do it all over again. If okay. not, we we modify the schedule and keep moving." Are you planning on moving back to the board chambers? Or are you going to be staying in this room? Because the board chambers is occupied on the third Wednesday of the month. Yeah, we, we plan to stay here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and, we, and we did check with Kern Cog for conflicting dates for, for this. For this, this building, this for this building. room. Yes. No. <laughs> so what is Mr. Rice doing? He's checking with the to see if they can actually be the media staff. We, we need them here in yes. order for this. Two at one time. Okay. We're in a holding pattern, apparently. We're, we're solving things. No, that's, uh, I like that. Okay. Okay. So it has been proposed that we um, tentatively move the meeting time to the third Wednesday of the month at 5.15 here at Kern Cog. Um, staff, media staff is available, county staff is available. Um, we will pose this as a tentative solution to the problem um, after conferring with the uh, county, com county supervisors. Started to call them county commissioners, we're not in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> They're supervisors. Um, so, do we need a we need a motion? Yes. So I'm looking for a motion and a second to follow through with this solution. <laughs> Make a motion to tentatively move our uh, meeting date to the third Wednesday of the month, Commissioner Crump. Second, McKibben. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Crump and a second by Commissioner McKibben. Uh, Chair. Subject to uh, Sub subject to, subject to the, the approval or the <laughs> conference with the uh, county supervisors. Do, do we still have the joint November December meeting the first Wednesday in December? Which is should not be a conflict. Yeah, I would I would assume that that would be uh, the November Th that December meeting date that that would stay the same simply okay. because uh, November wanna, and December are too difficult to want to confirm. Yes, right. Fair enough. Okay, so we need a roll call vote. That needs to be part of the motion. Oh, so what else do I need to say? <laughs> oh, okay, with uh, that, 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 with that, my that, make me think. <laughs> okay, on the first part, in doing with the uh, board of supervisors, making sure there's no conflict. Correct. And then also with the November, December, first Wednesday of the month meeting. Correct. Okay. Okay. Motion as amended by Commissioner Crump. Commissioner Young. Just make sure Mr. Crump is 
Mr. McKibben agrees with the amendment. Mr. McKibben, do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, so motion as amended by Commissioner Crump and seconded by Commissioner McKibben. Aye. Yes. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Fowler? No. Commissioner McKibben? Yes. Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Commissioner Saragoza? Aye. Okay. Five aye, one no. Motion passed. Thank you. Okay, our next item on the agenda is a report regarding the City of Bakersfield general plan. This is a continued item. Yes. I have requested the City of Bakersfield uh, preview tonight their upcoming general plan update. As the city considers future annexations, one of the issues that the commission considers during an annexation or detachment proceeding is whether property use is consistent with the city or county's general plan. What is a general plan? Oh. How is it used in the growth of a city? Are LAFCO actions helping or hurting the planning process? To facilitate and answer some of these questions, I have asked the city to make a presentation tonight on the current process to update the, their general plan. I would like to introduce Chris Boyle, Community Service Director with the City of Bakersfield. Thank you, Director Knox. Um, Madam Chair, esteemed commissioners, it's a pleasure to be in the friendly confines of LAFCO, making a presentation as it relates to my PowerPoint presentation, which is not on the screen right now. <laughs> I want to note that I'm under extreme pressure because a former student of mine, Mr. McKelvey here with Provost and Pritchard, who once had to weather three hours of Mr. Boyle, I was engaging, right? <clears throat> so I was engaging. Now I'm under extreme pressure to bring my A game for not only Mr. McKelvey, but my former employee, Mr. Davison. This kind of pressure is really tough to come by, but I'm going to weather through, all right? You have our support. Thank you. Now, if I could just have a multi-flex schedule, things would be awesome. Um, thank you. It really is a pleasure to be here, in all honesty. And um, I want to thank uh, LAFCO staff for inviting me to provide for a background. If I could go to PowerPoint, to slides there. Um, tab on the bottom, I think I'll be on a roll. Okay. Won't start. If I, get up here. I can't see any of the stuff. <laughs> Too small? Yeah, well, it's underneath the other stuff. So here we go. Aha, we're on a roll. <laughs> pressure, pressure. <laughs> Just like teaching days. <laughs> hey, Ryan? Um, so. It really is a pleasure to be here to talk about the Bakersfield general plan efforts. Uh, right now we're fully engaged in a general plan update, um, have been for some time, as our timeline will indicate. And uh, um, if you're so inclined, uh, I can punish you every other Thursday on, um, on the television with our news, our general plan updates with uh, Aaron Perlman and Fiona Dagger. Uh, I'm not recommending it, but um, sometimes they have raffles where you can actually win tickets to something just by watching me for three minutes. How about that way? Okay, that's working. So the first question uh, that w did you do that? I did that. So Thank you, Blair. I'm going to give you a nod. I mean, uh, Benton, I'll give you a nod, okay? Okay. Thanks, bud. So, um, the first question that was posed, and I'm hoping I can, if I don't answer these questions within this discussion, um, I'm hoping I can speak to questions from commissioners afterwards. But what is a general plan? There are many definitions of a general plan. Um, I oftentimes lean towards uh, the state's Office of Planning and Research um, guidelines for general plan preparation, um, but um, the one but the one I most usually go with is uh, a blueprint. Oh, you went too fast. Sorry. 
maybe I should come over there. <laughs> if I get closer, I'm comfortable with that. I have a big voice, too. We, and I like to get around the classroom, right? right? We, we, we need you in front of the microphone. I think he can carry the microphone. It's still not working. here. Yeah, I'm going to say next. We'll okay, <laughs> that's fine. Okay. My note that my slides, just like in college, don't have a lot of textual elements to them because I don't want to ask you to read something I'm saying. That would, that's just not my form. But one of my favorite definitions is a blueprint for the comprehensive long-term development of the city or a city. Uh, next slide. Now, there are bigger and more complex um, definitions. In fact, uh, I think the definition in OPR might go half a page. Um, but um, this is the definition we provide in our, our, RISE, our RISE website, www.bakersfield2045.com. And it says, a general plan is a policy document uh, required by the state of California it establishes a framework for the development and growth of the city and it's required over a 20 to 30 year term. Um, the, the definition goes on and elaborates on what some of the intents of the general plan are, how it serves the public and serves staff in serving the public and those are all valid positions that a general plan looks to satisfy over that term. Next slide please. But in the end um, it is a blueprint for the city, and it really is, uh, if, uh, from my perspective, and I think from all, um, all planners' perspective, a, a document that speaks to where the city wants to be over that term of a general plan. Uh, in this case, we're seeing about a 25-year term for the general plan they're working on right now. It's uh, assembled into uh, chapters that are oftentimes called elements and within those chapters there are through the public process we assemble principles and principles lead to goals and those goals lead to the formation of policies and then quite frankly to deliver upon that policy oftentimes there are action items so within each of those chapters there are specific principles goals and policies that lead to the, to the, that give the city direction as to what should occur over the span of the general plan effort. Um, action items typically are things that are specifically identified to meet that particular uh, policy. And um, I, I'm, I like to have action items because um, we should not only understand what we wish to do, but we should also have a pathway to get there, an understanding of what we need to do to satisfy that particular policy or goal. Next, please. I mentioned that there are chapters, or often in the general plan world, elements, and there are nine required mandatory elements per state law that are applicable to the Bakersfield area. Um, only the San Joaquin Valley is required to provide for an air quality element that looks and researches and provides for principles, goals, and policies with which to provide for beneficial air quality for the residents of the Bakersfield area. Um, and our consultant, um, Rincon Consulting, um, is tasked with uh, working with the public and city staff um, and decision makers in crafting principles, goals, and policies specific to meeting uh, better air quality standards for the Bakersfield area. Land use element um, is, uh, defines what types of land uses might be um, required or um, best suit the, the goals of the city in providing for suitable residential lands, industrial lands, commercial lands, and the like. And so it goes, the circulation element Housing element, I, I'd like to come back and talk specifically with you about the housing element, which it runs on a separate timeline. Housing elements aren't done every 20 to 30 years. They're done every eight years by law, and there are specific dates where they must be approved. And um, I could uh, probably wax poetic for at least another 15 or 20 minutes about the, the housing element process and uh, the requirements of that housing element. Um, but 
uh, there's a housing element which guides the housing needs of the community and so on and so forth. Conservation, open space, noise, safety, and a new element recently required, environmental justice. Now, you don't necessarily have to have each of these in by title, but each of these, these requirements must be satisfied um, within the general plan itself. So, for instance, uh, the environmental justice element could be um, distributed with specific EJ or environmental justice goals throughout the other individual elements. I think it's our expectation to um, call them out within the, the specific elements, but at the same time provide an EJ element that um, acts as a cumulative list of environmental justice uh, components that are easily accessed, readily available through a principal goals and policies approach. So all of these are actively um, being researched at this point in juncture. We don't have, in, at this point, we have not began to formulate the actual textual elements of these individual elements, save for the housing element, because that must be adopted by the end of this year. I think there's, I think the legislator provided an additional two weeks. I think the actual date today is January 13th, 2024. But typically in the past, there's a lot of new housing law and it, it seems like they adopt one every week, which places that timeline even more in jeopardy. In fact, one of my slides in a prior presentation, I think there were 77 housing related laws adopted in just 2017 alone. So you can, I really could wax poetic for a long time about the housing element and, and the various laws that must be satisfied. Each of, to come back on task though, each of these elements have specific requirements that must be satisfied by state law. Um, next slide, please. The city can also entertain optional elements that are brought about by understanding the will of the resident, what's important to the resident. And um, earlier, uh, well, later last year, we started this effort with workshops last April, and those workshops worked up just up until the holiday season. We held a total of seven public workshops, both the remotely and in person, um, that provided us opportunities to meet and engage with the public. We also released two surveys to the public on our, our Bakersfield 2045 website and had many, many pop-up events where we engaged with the citizen and asked them to take these surveys and identify what's important to them. Um, in one case, one of our surveys had over 800 responses. And when you look at that in terms of a city of uh, 400,000, to be able to touch you know, one in every uh, 4,000 or what, oh, I forgot my calculator right now, but to do 800 responses in a city of 400,000, really, that's a pretty deep dive into understanding what the will of the people is. And so we took all of that and, uh, and put that into one particular document. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, that document is gonna be released here in the next couple of weeks. It's a summary document and um, it, we also created a visioning document that is born out of that, out of um, that feedback from our citizenry, and so consequently, that will also be released on our website here in the next couple of weeks or so as well. We're kind of ramping up our our website in response to coming out of the holidays. So, what we have found is that at least my, my contract scopes six optional elements, and we have five that I, we think are are pretty um, pretty solid in terms of what, um, what the public would like to see. Um, the first one is economic development. Um, we have a new economic and community development department that needs to have principles, goals, and policies to guide it in realizing its mission. Um, a community design element, the, I mentioned all that housing law, and to be honest with you, um, that housing law asks for the city to be built in a more compact, urban dense form. It doesn't ask it, it mandates greater density within an urban form. And so a community design element is uh, intended to provide opportunities and uh, recommendations to our development community to help it and provide it the tools to build it a denser form. So um, I don't wanna just ask my development community and say, you're gonna build at this number of units an acre when um, HCD would tell me that the city is building at about 3.3 dwelling units an acre. 
And if I come around and all of a sudden tell them they'll build at twice that density, I might be well advised to provide them some guidelines as to how to do that. Community design is intended to do that. We have a tremendous uh, desire from our population to focus on our downtown. And so a downtown um, element is a natural fit within the general plan. We don't, you don't, you don't shape and uh, convert a downtown um, overnight. It really is a general plan cycle in developing goals and policies and action items that ultimately take that general plan to a place that the pop populace really wants to be in and enjoy. And uh, that's probably the number one overwhelming comment from the population in our, our public outreach. Um, public facilities and services is a carryover from the existing general plan. Um, that we feel at, adds merit um, in understanding um, what types of facilities and services will be required. Um, since the city, city's population estimates are at least 700,000, depending on how you look at it, somewhere between 700,000 and 780,000 in that term. And that's, you know, we doubled in the last 20, 25 years. And the reality is there's a real possibility that the city doubles in population over this general plan term, we need to think in terms of the types of facilities and services that'll be required of what will largely be um, a metropolitan area, uh, a, a significant city, not just in California, uh, from a national scale. Bakersfield's already a top 50 city nationally and in the top 10 within the state. And so we don't, we don't take that responsibility lightly and the general plan really needs to speak to those responsibilities in providing the, the facilities and services desi desired by our population. And lastly, quality of life. We, we hear our population say there's, uh, there's a need to focus on those things that improve our population's quality of life and to, to do so citywide, providing equity for all the residents within the community, whether that's um, providing more and better park spaces to providing better infrastructure for the various neighborhoods within the community um, or more social type uh, type issues um, that have been resonated um, in our conversations with our residents in looking to define how to lift up all segments of our our community and we see a quality of life element as being a tool with which to to uh, develop those principles, goals, and policies, and supporting action items. And again, all of these are reflective of the priorities of our community in our initial public outreach. It's not that we've stopped our public outreach. Um, we have a, another set of public outreach sessions coming up here in um, late, I'll call it early spring before summer. I think we've got them penciled for late April, early May where there'll be more opportunities to, uh, to engage with the, within the public. And um, I, I know that uh, we'll continue in identifying pop-up events so that the RISE campaign is, is seen throughout the community and we continue to engage with the people that the general plan ultimately is meant to benefit. Next, please. I also wanted to talk about the fact that oftentimes when you hear about a a general plan update, everyone says, well, that's just for the planning department. But a general plan touches every department in any municipality. Um, and it touches those departments in multiple ways. You know, development services, uh, my department, uh, will have a primary role in completing the housing element and being active in the land use element. But that isn't to say that I won't provide information as it relates to, as it relates to the circulation element or the open space element as we we collaborate in developing each of these these elements and the same can be said for all of the department public works recreation and parks as an example we see our open space element being an open space and parks element and the parks department is currently engaged in a parks master plan update so the open space and parks element acts as a bridge to that mass that that parks master plan. There'll be recommendations in that master plan, which ultimately will lead to principles, goals, and policies being born out of the general plan document. So as we look towards preparing formative documents, um, 
that aren't directly attached to the general plan, that doesn't mean we can't rely upon them and, and, and build bridges to those plans so that they're not, they're not plans that go on a shelf. They're, they're plans that you look to implement, um, implement those plans and provide for positive outcomes. So um, that's one of the primary components that I look at within a general plan because too many times I've been in a dialogue with someone and they say, well, that's just a planning document. And eh, is it going to go on a shelf? It's not. Um, you know, and I know that from talking with my other department heads, they fully understand that they have roles in the formulation of the general plan document such that it is a living, breathing a document that brings about positive change and impacts the community over its lifespan. Mm -hmm. Next. So why? Why? I think it's question number two. Why is there, why is the general plan being updated? Well. In, from, a, from, a, from an ordinal perspective, from a law perspective, um, it's time. Uh, there's about a 20-year cycle, and the last plan was adopted 21 years ago. We expect, to, um, expect this process to be completed in uh, March, April of 2025. So it's not a process you step into lightly. And uh, because it really is a, it's, it's not a race, it's a marathon in, in, in preparing a general plan document. And two, if you looked at the old general plan, the, the goals and policies of the old general plan don't, aren't necessarily reflective of, of a city of 410,000 people. Um, they, were, they were solid reflective goals from, from 2002, and it's two decades later. So the community has evolved and the collective needs and vision for that city has developed with it. Um, third point, uh, it, and so consequently, it does allow Bakersfield to shape its future growth. That, that's one of the important components of a general plan, to be reflective of and, and um, responsive to growth. If you look at uh, HCD, who, who has tasked me with building 37,461 units in the next eight years. It's important to be aware of and uh, responsive to that task from a state agency. But a general plan helps us, gives us that foundational blueprint to be successful in, in achieving those goals. Um, I noted there's a lot of laws out there um, from, from Sacramento. I want Take the time to thank Sacramento for their, for their providing me to, uh, with uh, work to no end. Uh, thank you, Sacramento. Um, and but in the end, uh, the the weight that's been placed on municipalities in terms of preparing a general plan is significant. There there are a lot of legislation passed by Sacramento that um, this general plan must bring us uh, current with. And candidly. Those laws I noted in 2017, they're not implemented within our current general plan, which is why we need to update the general plan to be more reflective of the, the ordinance that we're tasked with satisfying in the here and now. Lastly, allows the city to meet new requirements um, in its own way. It preserves local authority. Did you hear that, Sacramento? And offers <laughs> residents a greater voice. And the one thing I like uh, in our outreach campaign is that we continue to make certain that um, our general population has a voice in shaping um, shaping the general plan and how it's formulated. As an example, just yesterday I spent three hours at a Blue Zones meeting on the CSUB campus and my table, um, whether on accident or purposefully, was um, Fully, there was fully represent, full representation from the city. I had a council member with me. The city manager was with me. Um, I had an assistant director sitting on my right. And across the table, there were two citizens. And during that meeting, that's the people I wanted to focus upon because I haven't heard from them. I haven't heard from them. I gave my business card to those people. One of them was interested in becoming a fellow in our fellowship program. Um, absolutely, come see me, let's talk about that. But my focus is on hearing the people that typically aren't heard. And um, it's been a, a kind of a, 
I, if you might notice, I, I can talk um, at length, and so it's been an absolute pleasure to be able to engage with these people and and uh, hear what they think is important about their community. I'm, full full disclosure, I've been in the community for th about three and a half years now. I feel like uh, I'm a part of the Bakersfield community, but there is uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals that have called this town home for a lot longer than I've been here. And they've welcomed me from the day I got here. And that's one of those dynamics that I don't want to see change over time. And so I, I absolutely want to hear from the public. So let's shift for a moment. I think I'm on schedule. If you, want to, if you really want to know everything there is to know about the general plan, yesterday, now, and things scheduled into the future, I want to encourage you to go to www.bakersfield2045.com. In fact, you'll hear that tomorrow night, as, I mean, tomorrow morning as I'm talking with Fiona. And I think she'll probably echo it because she's heard it many times in my various Thursday morning events. And uh, by going to Bakersfield 2045 and the RISE campaign, you really be able to follow the general plan process where it was when we kicked it off. Every piece of information, every pamphlet from a particular outreach campaign is available on there as part of the uh, uh, prior meeting materials and the like plus any scheduled events will be there and you can so you can mark your calendar and um, you can see as as different publications are released um, in the general plan effort and we spent a lot of time trying to make sure we've heard the public we're going to begin to shape that into formulative documents that kind of provide a synopsis of their vision statement for the city and then we're going to move forward with with um, the general plan preparing those individual elements so I'm going to go through the individual tabs here because really this is a great receptacle um, uh, people who are turned on to it use it because um, however you want to participate even if it's anonymously there's an opportunity to do so um, so the first tab is home. In this case, right now we're talking about we have clickable links to things that are topical. We just released our, our city story, which is a, a storybook of the city's history. Goes through all the key events in the city. It's interactive. It's engaging. And we want your comments as it relates to it. And you can leave comments if you so desire. Um, you can learn about the general plan. We have tabs that talk about just the form, the formative, formulative components of what a general plan is and isn't, uh, and the, the laws associated with it. Same with the housing element. And we have a, a video right here that's been there from the start that talks about um, why we're doing it. And, um, and so that's just the first tab. The second tab is our, our story. And this is really that storybook that's, that there's a link uh, from the first page. And um, this is the this is a this this is a scrolling storybook. So you scroll through it. This is the first image of that. So um, it's a byproduct of our existing conditions um, background report that was released in September 2022. And so um, the, our story really tells the story of the city and kind of sets the tone for moving forward. Next tab, please. There is a about tab. So here's opportunities to um, see about upcoming meetings, view those past materials, sign up for project updates. You can do any and all of those things on the website. And as I noted, so if you want to get noticed every time there's a change in the in on the website, you can put your email in there and you're gonna get a you're gonna get an update every time there's something new that comes to the website or when there's a new event that you that you may want to participate in. Um, or at the same time, you may review uh, the storybook or the existing conditions background report or some of the other publications on the website. You just want to be anonymous. You can anonymously provide comments as it relates to that document. Mm -hmm. so we don't want to not hear from anybody, people who don't want to give their name and name and email and don't really want to be totally engaged in the process. That's fine. I still want to hear from you. I still want to know what you think. Right now, there's a super trifecta available on the website where you can look at our city story map 
and provide comments. You can look at the, uh, the city's existing conditions background report. I'll talk more about that report as I go through this presentation. I'll try not to belabor it too much longer. And then the city is also pr preparing a climate action plan um, in conjunction with and in an, with the ability to inform our, our EIR for the general plan update, our environmental impact report. So um, that's also another uh, deliverable that my department is actively engaged in. You can click on either, any of those three and go to those and review them. Here's the, the Get Involved tab again. Um, here you can, you can put your email in, it's optional. You can enter comments and the like. Um, and there's, there's other parts of that tab where you can actually check the box and say, keep me involved. There's a documents tab. And um, right now, we're, that's the freshest thing that's come out on the process. We don't, at some point in juncture, we're gonna be releasing a public review draft and there'll be opportunities for comments again. Right now, um, we're, we're going through the RISE existing conditions background report. I'll talk about more about that in just a moment. And then there's a resources. You know, I'm kind of looking at this as my instant bookmark because as I find even more documents um, that I want added into the resources, it's a great one-stop shop. You want to see the old general plan? You want to see the last housing element? Do you want to see any one of a number of formulative um, documents that the city um, utilizes in implementing the vision of the citizen? Right there on the resources tab. So just touch base a little bit. These are two of my favorite little quotes as it relates to being a land use planner. The first one is, you can't know where you are going until you know where you are. And that's where the in 16 conditions background report is so important in a general plan effort. And along those lines, the ECBR um, gives us a glimpse of the future through the lens of the present. All of the efforts we've made early on in this process is to understand the city today and how it got there. Um, another one of my favorite uh, little quotes came from, and quite frankly, it came from Yi Fu Tuan, who was a uh, professor at UC Berkeley's School of Geography. And I was assigned in grad school to read one of his papers. And the, the title of the paper was something to the effect that um, you, you can't understand the built environment until you understand what has been retained or discarded from the past. That was in the title. Aside from reading the 20 pages, honestly, my report to my professor was, if it wasn't for the title, I would have had no idea what the man was talking about. But um, <laughs> I've held on to that thought because when you think about what, what's important to us, what's important to us, we're a city that's 125 years old. What's been retained that's 125 years old? What, that's a reflection of what's been important to us versus not important to us. We're looking to protect uh, a train station. The train station almost was torn down. The public said, hey, that's important to us. And so we have this opportunity to keep something from the past that reflects the values of the present. So a general plan is a big part of shaping what's important to us, what's kept, what isn't kept, what do we build, what do we tear down? And the existing conditions background report is really that foundational piece. It is a culmination of us examining the city and uh, providing a one-stop shop to understanding how the city is today. Now, this is what the old general plan looked like. I, I swear to God, I think it was typed on a typewriter, but probably not in 2002, probably not. I do have documents in my in my quiver of documents that actually were typed. And uh, I'm thinking they maybe need to be refreshed because um, I don't know. I don't know if we have a typewriter in the, in the building today. <laughs> but you're looking at a black and white I document. I don't know if I could use that circulation map. Could you know where you live on that map? I dare say we might have to take some time to do that but that is the official circulation map of the 2002 general plan. The, the goals and policies, you can see these goals and policies. Right there, this is a part of the, uh, part of the circulation element. So we have goals and policies right here, goals one, two, three, and so on and so forth. 
So that formulation, how a general plan is built, is still pretty much the same. What it looks like today is very different than what the old documents of the past look like. So this, these are slides right out of my existing conditions background report. And you can see on the bottom end, there's different, uh, different sections that are called out. So this is the number two about Bakersfield, and it's just you've got this this display of the various Can demographics of the community. No, I mean sure that'd be, be my pleasure. <laughs> never a non, never a conformist. Okay, I think I'll stay at the podium. All right. So there's a slide. You know. These are engaging graphics that allow you to digest information that in 2002 would, that would have been in a very drab, black and white, maybe there'd be bullets, but that was kind of high tech in 2002. Next slide, please. Here's uh, a slide on land use, um, where on the one side we're looking at where our sales tax dollars come from, the various segments of the economy, where that sales tax come from. So, you know, 26% comes from automobiles, uh, sales and repairs. Wow, that's a big chunk of sales. Uh, no wonder the city places such emphasis on its auto mall. On the other side, you're looking at the, the acreage for the individual land use types within it. Again, very graphic. I, I don't think I've ever actually read noise as a table of different types of noise uses until this which takes me from zero decibels to 100 decibels, and it does it in an engaging way that informs the reader without boring them. Uh, the other slide is about parks, and it uh, has an interesting way of showing us all the different parks and the types of facilities therein with a, with a nice graphic that takes the reader into the way the city is today. And remember, this is coming from an existing conditions background report. This is data contemporary to the now. Did I go buy one? No. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's an opportunity to see our existing conditions background report. I'm really excited about it because I see it as a window in to our general plan update. I like the fit and form of it, how it engages the individual. I can see those goals, principles, goals, and policies being formulated in an engaging way with action items, which gives us direction how to implement those goals and policies. And I'm excited about it, I'm really excited about it. Did I mention I'm excited about it? <laughs> Just checking. Here's our timeline, this is it. Whoop. Here's our timeline, and you know, um, note that we've been at this uh, about nine months now. My as my, as my assistant city manager would say, my mighty but small, or is it small but mighty crew? Somebody here said I, I had deep pockets with personnel. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> trust me, um, trust me. Let's do a comparative of all the other top 10 cities in the state of California. Um, but we're on schedule right now, uh, against all odds, to be honest with you. Um, we're working hard to stay on that schedule, to deliver to the citizens of the city of Bakersfield a contemporary uh, general plan that speaks to the various um, legislative updates that have come over time. And um, so we are on schedule. We're also on schedule with our housing element update at the same time. Um, and so we're on schedule with our climate action plan. We're on schedule with our, um, boy, I got too many, habitat conservation plan. All those things are happening um, and they're happening on schedule. And that said, that completes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions you might have. <laughs> Otherwise, receive and file. I, I have a question. Uh, the city shares the metro area with developed unincorporated areas. How does this affect your plan and future growth? What collaboration takes place with the county in relation to the general plan to ensure development and growth happens in an intelligent way? Currently, and um, in 20 something year career, I've never worked in an environment where there was a shared general plan with a shared sphere and zoning reflective of when the property was in the county versus in the city. 
and not really any clear vision specific to the sphere and the general plan planning area because it was a shared element. People ask me how that happened. I, I don't know. All I know is from my professional experience as a land use planner, um, I've never seen where a sphere, um, well, my experience would be that sphere of influence um, is there to uh, accommodate and accept the growth of a municipality as growth occurs. But in a shared general plan, you see growth occurring by the county in the sphere as well as the city. And often, it, it, it doesn't have any, any continuity as to what the mission of one, one community, one municipality is doing versus its partner agency, the county. And um, it, you can see what that looks like, really, when you look at the map of the city limits of the city of Bakersfield. As I was sitting here getting ready to, to do this presentation, something dawned on me where I'd like to bring that back to this group because I'd be curious. I'll bet uh, my former GIS um, analyst probably can provide to me a map of the city limits in the year 2002 when the last general plan was adopted. And, and that, that's when our shared scenario began, I believe. And so I'd love to understand where we are then versus where we are now, because when you look at our city limits, it's, it's, it's crazy all over the place. It's not efficient for the, for the residents of either the county or the city. It, it costs me and you and you, the taxpayer, egregious amounts of money supporting two agencies, two law enforcement agencies, two fire departments, two of everything, two trash collections, two of everything that, that, that doesn't need to be there. That's a byproduct of a, of a shared general plan, a municipal general plan. And if you look out into the future, I know there are better things for, we to, for us to spend our money on. And we're stepping into another recession, or there's at least words, I didn't say that word. We're, uh, we're stepping into another small downturn in the economy. And I wanna say the R word. But we need to be cognizant that I think that's something lost on our current generation, that these things cost money. And where does the money come from? From your pocket, from your pocket, from your pocket. Having a new general plan that's exclusive to the city of Bakersfield with a sphere that's identified by your board, by your commission, um, helps the city of Bakersfield begin to better accommodate the growth that that it's anticipated to provide for and do that in an efficient way with efficient government. So I hope that answers your question because um, it doesn't fully. Do I want to collaborate with the county? We have a terrible track record of collaboration with the county. I don't have, I don't have a track record with my peers. Uh, I'm, I'm, an, oh, I'm, a, I'm available, I'm engaging, mm -hmm. I, I want the best thing, I like good governance be one of my bylines to every one of my employees that walks in the door. There'll be a quiz at the end of the period. And, um, <laughs> but but that, that's one of my mantras. We need to practice good governance. Because good governance saves our taxpayers money. And we're not doing that right now. Would I like to engage? You bet. I'm going to have to engage with, with the county over time. Um, because we need to problem solve together. You know, I learn about development that's occurring directly adjacent to my city at densities that HCD would cringe at, the, the State Department of Housing and Community Development, and I'm not even noticed that it's happening. That's not good collaboration, and in the end, we all pay for it. I hope that answers your question. It does. With that said, I'd like to thank you for inviting I do have me. A question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for my for long pause. I apologize. Sure Barbara to say something, but uh, <laughs> maybe she will after I talk. Uh, thank you for that update on the general plan. It was very good. Uh, excellent slides. I've had, I think I've attended at least three meetings, um, uh, face to face and Zoom, which are very helpful. We and appreciate your participation in a big way. 
and I actually read the full report, the existing conditions background report. It was very good. And uh, for those of you who don't know, it's a baseline of demographic and environmental data as of 2022, matter of fact. And uh, I didn't agree with some of the stats, but you're pretty much spot on. Hopefully that'll be improved. Uh, I recommend anybody to read that if they're doing any kind of um, demographic or grant development. It's a lot of good data. Um, um, in a nutshell, <laughs> what, I, what I find interesting, um, first of all, we are a, I could be wrong on this, Blair, um, LAFCO is a state mandated county agency. We're not part of the county, but we are, our jurisdiction is the county, and we have representatives from special districts and cities, as well as, as the board of supervisors. Um, and, and Bakersfield is our number one city, and they have an existing commissioner on, on, the, on the commission. Uh, the other 10 cities, they rotate, and I believe we have at least two. Uh, I think uh, Mayor Saul represents McFarland, and he's on a Zoom call with us. And uh, any other cities currently? Mr. Crump. Mr. Crump. I forget. <laughs> so sorry about that. And so one of the things that we do um, is we represent the county, and we are a partner with the cities, and we definitely want to be a partner with all cities, especially the biggest city in Kern County. And as you probably already know, we are uh, under the um, direction of, what we do is under the direction of the Cortese Knox Hertzberg Local Government Reorganization Act of 2000, CKH for short. And um, basically that act, among other things, says promote orderly growth, prevent sprawl, sprawl preserve agricultural and open space, and assure for efficient, sustainable public services. Um, and and uh, I think staff does a very good job in trying to do that with all the cities, the county, and special districts. But there's a lot of challenges there, and I won't get into all the challenges since this meeting is already taking a long time. But um, I was looking at your elements, which I, I uh, I'm glad you, you were able to show that to everybody. And I can see how LAFCO has a direct influence or collaboration with open space, conservation, housing, and safety, and to some degree with land use and environmental justice issues. Um, and and when, as we move into 2023, we definitely want to be a uh, uh, a responsible partner in the general plan update for Bakersfield um, since we are you know interested in those things such as preserving open space ag lands curbing urban sprawl encouraging efficient delivery of services etc and definitely want to promote public accountability and transparency I think in the future as you mentioned there'll be a slight downturn in the economy <laughs> And there may be struggling special districts and cities who are trying to uh, promote public accountability in how they use their funds. Um, I think perhaps there should be uh, more dialogue between LAFCO and the cities and special districts. I'm not sure what that is, if it's a, a task force or some type of a, a round table discussion, but these type of things I think are very helpful. Um, and you're not the only city that will be probably updating the general plan, but obviously you're the biggest city. Uh, one of the questions I have, um, and you had mentioned um, the train station, which I'm uh, in favor of preserving, if we could possibly do that. Um, is there going to be a historic preservation element in the general plan? Thank you. That's a good question. I know that we'll speak to historic preservation as a dynamic within a particular element. Um, for instance, perhaps in the conservation element. Um, but I don't have direction quite yet. 
I have an I have an open element, and um, I don't. But I don't have direction as to what what that last element could be. Um, I fully hear from meetings the that uh, there is a desire to protect uh, the character of the city and its important structures, and, and quite frankly, its important institutions. You know, one thing I really love about living here is that it's it's a big town with a small town vibe. We really want to protect that. And part of protecting that is making sure that we protect our historic structures. We don't necessarily have to tick, pick them up out of the ground and take them to a park. Um, but to uh, identify historic districts and look to uh, provide support through the general plans, goals, and policies um, in ways to uh, enhance the capability of protecting districts. I've got a building right now, um, right down, right across the street, actually that is actively engaged in going on to the National Register. And um, that's kind of why it's taking a little bit of time for the Walworth building to see improvement, in case you're curious. The, there's some extra steps involved in, in being added to the National Historic Register, and that allows them to use older building codes to protect the integrity of the older structure. So. Um, don't think it isn't happening. It really is happening. But that's a reflective. That's just one example where that's something that the city's, the city's residents really want to protect. And I'm sure it's not the only one. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Very colorful, accessible graphics, which give a lot of information in a very easily received way and very charmingly delivered. Thank you. Well, thank you. Does that mean you'll invite me back for the housing element? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a possibility. <laughs> okay, thank I, you. I have a follow-up question for Mr. Helen. <laughs> it's related to our last meeting that Mr. Boyles brought up. I think it's called the Analyst Fellow Program. You were going to investigate that if it's simply confined to the city or can an agency such as LAFCO receive one of your interns? It, have you had any chance to follow up? I, I can. I can, I okay. can. I can take this one. Uh, yeah, that, uh, we actually, I talked to not only the uh, person in our office handling the grant because this is funded through a grant from the state that we've applied to, but I also talked to our uh, city attorney, and there would be a, a, a direct conflict of us paying for uh, at something like that, or even transferring those grant funds for a purpose that's not specifically for the city. So, a nice idea. I like I like the idea. Always being creative. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any other questions, and I appreciate those who have belabored my presentation. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. Thank you. Yes. Director Knox. Okay. Moving on. Um, we do not have any items for closed session tonight. If there's no further business. No, we still have my miscellaneous oh. items. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I, well, I, I we have do, some, don't we? I actually have some things to talk about. You one do. of them, one of them is kind of important. Yes, of course. Well, all, everything's important, but uh, first, there is a requirement of a sitting of sitting on an agency board or commission in California. It is the state of economic statement of economic interest, otherwise known as the Form 700, that needs to be filled out and signed at various st stages of occup occupancy on a board or commission. For most commissioners, we need to get those from your primary agency, county, city, special district that you represent. Uh, whenever you turn one in, make sure you have LAFCO on as one of the additional agencies uh, on your form. Uh, for public members, we need a wet signature one for, from, from you. So um, there's that. Got a letter from SDRMA, which is the organization that provides our, our insurance. Uh, they have sent us notice that nomination period for their 2023 SDR, SDRMA Board of Directors is now open and ends May 1st. So if any commissioner is interested in serving, please contact me and I'll share the details. I'm not expecting any of you to want to do this, but 
you've now been properly noticed. Uh, lastly, I do have, a, I, I want to start a conversation with the commission about where LAFCO is, where we've, how we've been operating, and where we want to go in the future. Um, LAFCO has, has a role in how services are provided throughout the county, uh, and this is a topic that has been on my mind for a long time, and this seems like the, the right time to approach this. Um, Countywide, there are 182 agencies that Colonel LAFCO is a primary, primary authority. 11 cities, 91 independent special districts, and 80 CSAs. To break it down further, there are seven cemetery districts, five abatement and vector control districts, 11 community service districts, 80 county service areas, seven healthcare districts, nine rec and park districts, there were six, but now there's five resource conservation districts. We dissolved one in December, five sanitation districts, and 32 water districts, and there's miscellaneous others. I, I have yet to meet someone who thought 182 agencies is the appropriate number of agencies to provide services in, in Kern County. It's large. It's, it's ridiculously large. And one of the reasons why is for the history of what I know LAFCO and what I've seen from past, we have been a passive agency. We act, for the most part, when someone brings us a project. We have not been an agency that steps out front and asks the questions, are we providing services in an efficient way that the law tells us we're supposed to be doing? Uh, and so over time, we've created layer after layer after layer of government. Um, to take this a step further, City of Bakersfield, if you can put that, that map up, I, I brought a couple of larger maps sitting over there on the side. Um, For some reason, it's not moving. Let me turn these off. Not exactly sure what's happening. Um, I'm short. <laughs> it is warm in here. There we go. This is the map of the Metro Bakersfield area. And what you're looking at is a representation of the 71 different agencies that provide services in the Metro Bakersfield area. For one city and the surrounding areas, it requires 71 agencies as we currently have it. I would like to reduce that number considerably. There's multiple ways we can do that. And it's having this many is inefficient, it's bur bur burdensome, and in my opinion, not serving the best interests of the public. St in state code, it, it asks us to, to look at orderly development, efficiently extending government services, providing services in the most efficient manner feasible. We aren't doing that. But so we need to start asking the question, how, what do we need to change in order that we do provide services? We have layer after layer of government that's not necessary. In our own procedures, standards, and policies, we call for orderly development, adequate government services at a reasonable cost, and, mu and look to mu multifunctional ag agencies that are better at serving than single fu function agencies. So how do we provide efficient, reliable services? 
We do it through consolidation, taking districts and merging them together. In some cases, um, adding new services to a district that had not had them before and dissolving a district or ser actually bringing the two districts together and making one out of them. We can do either one of those. Um, other ways through annexation. We, we've, over the last four or five years, reduced the number of CSAs in the Metro Bakersfield area when we've taken in areas um, that were islands. So, so that was one way to, to resolve that. Uh, we've also um, had conversations with the county of taking all those CSAs and instead of having one for each specific area, creating a CSA that's just for sewer that covers the entire county and then you have service areas within it. So we reduce from the 80 to about six or seven um, CSAs that would cover us countywide. It would be much more efficient for the county and much more efficient for the work we do. Um, it's it, this is something that's going to take a considerable amount of time. I might have mentioned it before. Um, we don't do not share um, all the same data as the county on which CSAs are currently active. Um, prior to LAFCO's existence, the county was a responsible agency to to develop and run um, CSAs, county service areas. In 64, when we took over, we ran, we, we were responsible for their formation and detachment and, you know, detachment uh, dissolution process uh, up until the mid-80s when it was given back to the, to the county. They ran it for about a decade and it was given back to us. So during those times, we did not do a good job of sharing data and so we have a discrepancy. One way to solve that discrepancy is for the county to complete what we requested six years ago, a municipal service review. I have once again gone back to the county and, and asked them to make that a priority. Um, so we know what exactly we're, we're dealing with when we try to move forward. When I talk about annexation, I'm not just talking about islands. I'm talking about uh, even larger areas and not just the city of Bakersfield. Uh, when I worked for Supervisor Watson 20 years ago, it was actually the, when I first met Bud, he was working at Taft, and we were working on a project to bring up Ford City, South Taft, and Taft Heights to a service level good enough that the city would be able to take those areas in and make them part of the city. We did some projects, but staffing left and other things i left for one thing um bud left for another <laughs> and it seemed to fall by the wayside um, these are projects that are going to take years if not a decade to, to to finish but i plan to be here that long so i'm kind of looking at we need to start now uh, to get some of these projects moving forward Another area to help provide efficient, reliable services is to discontinue uh, residential development in urban areas by the county. Uh, they've been doing this for a considerable amount of time, and every time they do, we add on additional layers of government that go, goes with it. And it's something I've started to have a conversation with the county about. Uh, there is some interest in how you do that because they have some of the same RENA numbers that the city has to work with. Um, RENA meaning regional housing, the state mandates that, was it how many thousand? 37,461 units in the next eight years. Right, and the county has a number that's like 30,000? Uh, I think they're below 30, I think it's like 26,000. Okay. And there is actually a process you can go through where if a, if a unincorporated area is brought into a city for residential development like he's, he's need, needing to do, the county actually gets credit for it as well. But there has to be agreement between county and city to do that. Uh, and 
I'm optimistic that something like that can happen because for the first time in probably 25 years, the county and city can actually sit in a room and talk to each other without screaming at each other. <laughs> and that is a refreshing change uh, that is going that's taking some um, give and take on both sides. And uh, I, I think that we are at a place where there can be reasonable conversations and be able to move forward. So wh what needs to happen to be more proactive? Uh, we need to revise and strengthen our local policies. Strangely, we're going to have a, a policy committee that can look at these. Um, we need buy-in from our partner agencies, the counties, the cities, and special districts. Uh, in order to do some of these, we're going to need some additional resources to fund consultants and studies. Nothing gets done without a feasibility study, so we actually know what we're looking at and, and be able to move forward in a, in a smart manner. Uh, I believe that anytime I ask for additional resources, I'm like, uh, yeah, there he goes asking for more money again. But I believe the savings that will be that will be made by looking at these and eliminating some of these districts will more, more and more um, be worth the cost of going through this process. Th there isn't one answer that's going to solve all of these. There's there's going to be creative things that solve some of these issues. Um, I, we're talking to some folks up in Lake Isabella. They they have a defunct golf course that they would like to create a rec and park district up there. At the same time, we have a cemetery district that's just barely operating up there. Well, it happens that a rec and park district actually has cemetery services as one of the services they can provide. We might be able to do something creative where they can have a rec and park district up there, but also create a better environment, um, a better structure for the cemetery to be operational. So there's different ways that you can look at at doing these that are going to have to we're going to have to get creative and, and to do these type of projects and to move forward. La lastly, what I need is a commitment from the com commission. I, I believe that when I talk to people about the overarching issue of having so many districts, so many agencies providing services none of them are going to be able to argue that that 182 is, is a good number. Just about everyone I've talked to has said it would be smarter to have a, a more streamlined, fewer districts, and fewer entities providing services. The problem is going to come when we start actually wanting to merge them or dissolving them. People are going to come out of the word works and go, not in my backyard. You're not taking away the benefits I get from being on this border commission, not my neighborhood, and it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough, but if we're going to actually look at providing what's best for the community and best for our, our community, our county, we have to stand strong. And, and frankly, if I don't have backup from the commission, why would I bother going through all this work? Because this is going to be a lot more work, especially for Bud. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm thinking of as we're, as we're trying to move forward. And I, I really kind of want your input of where you would like to see LAFCO go in the future and where we would like to, to take this. That's my presentation. It is on the agenda. It's under my miscellaneous is it, items. Is it actually listed? No. Oh. Well, you don't want to. You can we're, get not, some general we're not. We're not making decisions here. We're we're having a discussion. Well, I do as have a. The, as long as the discussion that doesn't mimic, mimic getting to a decision. Correct. It can't be. A, there's no actual. No there's no actual action, actionable item that I'm asking I'm not, for. I'm suggesting that the, that the <laughs> discussion has to be. be very general and it can't yes. be specific. Yes. Okay. I have a general question. <laughs> um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, something that I um, 
I used to work for the county and city, and we always had strategic plans to determine our workload, action plans. I noticed, obviously, the state law requires the city to have a general plan. Does the uh, CKH Act uh, Act require anything from LAFCOs, like a general plan or strategic plan or anything? We have our policies and procedures, but not a specific right, no, not a but plan. As, as, as uh, um, Christopher was saying, there's goals, policies, and action points, action plans, or action timelines. We don't have that. We have general policy and procedures, and, and therefore, um, I. It is, I think other LAFCOs have done this, where they come together and they say, let's talk to our neighboring partners, cities and special districts, and come up with like a strategic urban service delivery, delivery plan that might be out for five or 10 years. And this way we can kind of all be on the same page when it comes to any kind of um, Planning? annexations, detachments, or reorganizations. I'm not sure if you're listening, but if you are, I am. <laughs> okay, so it it appears to me that that is something that perhaps could be discussed at our next policy meeting, a subcommittee policy committee meeting, and maybe look at at uh, a long-term plan. Whether I don't know what you want to call it, but something that would put be we can put on paper, and obviously it may require feasibility and consultant services of some sort, and if so. Uh, that could be discussed and then put on the next agenda for more a deliberate decision as to what we want to do. But that's just thinking out loud. Anybody else? Do any of the other commissioners have comments or questions? I'll jump in. Thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. I'm not making an argument for 182 or whatever the number is, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of this comes down to local control. And that's, that is a bugaboo to try to break. Um, and I, I can make no argument for any particular agency to continue to exist, but they were created for a purpose. And I think it, it's a little maybe dangerous territory to say, you no longer should exist because we have policies and procedures that give us the right to tell you you don't. So I'm not saying not to proceed on this, but it's a tough nut to crack. And I would be interested when we get the details about the different agencies, Bud's going to do his magic. I'm, I'm interested in when the various agencies were developed and um, became, you know, law. And we're a funny county because we've grown like topsy. There's been no planning. I mean, we have a general plan, but I mean, in general, we've Greenfield and Rosedale and all these different areas grew up independently. And then we're trying to tie them all together to have some a universal one. And it, it's hard to do. And I would say that it, we might have real problems addressing agencies that we may think they're not really doing a good job. We may not think that they're effective or efficient or, um, you know, using money properly, but they have a say in that, and the people who created them have a say in that. So I'm just suggesting that it, as a general idea, it sounds absolutely great, but Specifically, it may be more challenging than we even can imagine. Not, not being a naysayer, just kind of. Um, I'm very aware of what I'm taking on, and I am willing to be the bad guy in a lot of situations. Um, but I, none of this is going to happen without buy-in from other agencies. Um, I, I've got multiple examples of agencies now that are failing. Um, that need help. Um, I've got a, a CSD out in, out in the Ridgecrest area that can't bill their customers because they can't afford the meters that have been, that have, have broken. They can't re afford to replace them. 
Um, so they are in serious trouble right now. They don't even have money to tell us, you know, we we want to dissolve. <laughs> we LAFCO needs some ability to step in and say, hey, water district, hey, city, you're next, next door. How do we work together? Do Can we put together a feasibility study together of how – this, we can po possibly take this action um, to help that, help that community and possibly reduce the number of agencies while we're at it. Ultimately, it's about providing services. And uh, the argument of, of local control, I'm, I'm not advocating any control leaving Kern County. I, I don't want the state to have any more control um, than they already have. I mean, the state gives county and local government control on lo local land use, but then they turn around and pass 200 bills on land use. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I don't want any more uh, state of California coming in and, and telling us how we do our job. I, I want to keep the control here locally, but some of these districts are so small, and they, there's just no efficiency in size of, of them anymore. They might have been able to get away with that in the 70s and 80s and 90s, but they are, you know, especially some of these water districts that have water quality problems. You know, we saw that up in Weldon, and we worked a dozen years to get that problem solved. Um, what I'm saying is if we are passive, it just pushes it down the road further. And I'm, I'm wanting to identify um, projects that need to happen I've got, and start moving forward with those in a way that helps both the community, the community and everyone else. I'll throw someone under the bus. The Lamont Public Stormwater District has not met in two years. I don't know where they are. I don't know who they are. Um, I had another district say, why don't you dissolve them? And I said, that would be great, but then who provides the service? So that qu we need to take it from that conversation to how do we move forward that makes this work? Um, because that district that is now possibly defunct and it was definitely inactive, um, we, need to, we need to do something on. But that's going to take resources and time and, and effort to do that and actually stepping forward and and taking the lead in many, many cases. Th that's the kind of thing I'm talking about doing, not saying, you know, um, one district has to go and the other gets to stay. Mm -hmm. One of the issues I, I, I see is there are five entities providing sewer service in Metro Bakersfield area. There doesn't need to be five. <laughs> there there are creative ways to deal with that that we can we can we can look at that serves everybody in in, in the metropolitan bakersfield area they're sharing lines they're sharing facilities but then we have five you know administrations running them i have a follow-up question uh, first of all i i really uh, appreciate your update on that, I didn't realize some of the things until now. <laughs> Even though I've been here almost two years, I, I learn something new every time I come to these meetings. Uh, I have two questions. One is for you, and the other one is for the city. The first question is, um, what is the population of that map, the metropolitan area, and how did you define the, the boundaries? That's the sphere of influence. Determined by? The, the sphere of influence of the city of Bakersfield. Approved by Lafco. Approved by Lafco. Okay. Our, but the population, our, you don't know. Well, that's what they're. That's what I uh, just requested. Okay. In the draft of the MSR. Are we looking, looking at six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand? Yeah, I, I, you know that that number um, obviously is a combination of both county pockets and city. So I I think you're safe saying somewhere in the six hundred. Range. I was at the Blue Zone project yesterday at CSUB, which was great. And uh, was Kern Cog there? Oh, they should be there. 
<laughs> you might want to talk to your executive director. But the question I asked was, uh, what what is the metro area that they were looking at? And they said it was around 525,000 people, which included Oildale and, and unincorporated pocket, uh, pocket islands. The second question is, this, and I know you've kind of alluded to this, does the city of Bakersfield have like a joint, not a task force, but a mutual meetings of the minds where department heads with the county and the city talk about service areas, service delivery to adjacent areas to the city and, and the county, kind of like a, not like a current call, but more like a mini, mini subcommittee. Is that something that, that you guys are talking or doing at, in, any, in any fashion? And I'm thinking out loud, I can't think of the term that would be used, but it would appear that, uh, you know, you brought up a good point, uh, Mr. Boyle, uh, they should be telling you <laughs> what's going on before they approve a development. And, and is there anything that we can formalize that require folks, f especially since we have two supervisors on this commissioner commission to perhaps instruct county staff to say this is something that we need to investigate and, and for better governance we would love to get the support of this commission and the support of the two supervisors that are on this commission to have uh, additional dialogue with our county uh, land use uh, folks I think you heard from mr. Boyle tonight pretty clearly that uh, those occur uh, without any like, hey, we just want to give you a, you know, a, 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 a courtesy notice. Not even that we need your comments. We want to, you know, work with you. Just a courtesy notice would be would be great. So any any influence this commission can have to to assist us in working better with the county, we would appreciate. Well, under CEQA, if there's a county improvement in an unincorporated area, let's say a, a major uh, development, whether it's commercial or housing, that triggers a, a negative deck or an EIR, isn't the city a responsible agency and you would be notified? <laughs> I, they, they can, they take their own CEQA actions. They don't, the county, you know, has those same authorities as it relates to CEQA. They don't share the draft documents for comment? Again, we That's would unusual. love if you can have an influence <laughs> on on having the county okay. uh, be. Well, I'm not a CEQA secret. attorney, but it would appear that they're not res res complying with the CEQA Act. That's don't, my personal opinion. Don't the CEQA compliance rules mean that they just have to be made public? No. No, there's certain agencies that have to be notified. Uh, if the city is so close to the project area itself and they have to be notified. LAFCO needs to be notified. So there is certain agencies that has to be notified on some of these. We are not notified on all the developments, yeah. even though we've asked for that multiple times. I learn of, I learn of county development by following their website. And then I'll print that staff report. Those staff reports are, re are usually released at 72 hours per the law, which really, is used to op really doesn't leave an opportunity to provide meaningful comment. Um, either, I suppose I could make that in person, but in terms of providing a written response that's added to the record or providing a meaningful dialogue about uh, the relative merit of a project. Um, I'm not sure my opinion is sequestered or, or desired. <laughs> what you're talking about, Commissioner Zaragoza, is something to the tune of a technical advisory committee where joint agencies have regularly scheduled meetings to talk about such matters that impact all of them. And they can be, they can be very good um, tools for agencies that coexist in close uh, proximity to one another to work collaboratively and make certain that what, what one hand is doing, the other is aware of. Um, and I've seen that, I haven't, uh, it's been some time since I worked for a county, but um, one of my first agencies was Alpine County, which was in close proximity to Tuolumne County, as well as Amador County and El Dorado County. 
And those counties interacted uh, very collaboratively with one another because they shared so many boundaries with one another. And, uh, and, were, and it was important too because as an example, uh, you have several state highways that really, these are alpine counties um, with real weather concerns. And so where those counties directed their transportation dollars was very important to the residents because they relied upon mostly state highways to stay open in the wintertime. So, um, but that's the kind of, uh, the kind of format that, that you're speaking to. I'm glad you mentioned that. There is already a framework and it's through the COG. They have a technical advisory committee, and I believe it's uh, the representatives are from the cities and the county, and they meet monthly, I believe, on various issues, probably transportation related. It would be nice if we had one for urban service delivery and land use. I think that'd be a great idea. Just a thought that we should perhaps investigate. I'm not sure who would take the lead on that, but I'm just throwing it out there. Thank you. Likely, yes. Mr. Knox, any further? I could give you stories all night, but I don't want to, <laughs> <laughs> of other projects that we're working on behind the scenes that sure. um, are difficult and are going to need help. Um, so I'm guessing we'll be revisiting this again. Yeah, we will. And it's, okay. it's unfortunately the supervisors aren't here tonight because they are a key part of this. So we'll be revisiting this again we will. when the supervisors are here. So we'll have their ear. And we will be yes. in policy committee. We'll be looking at our policies related to this. Um, I guess I should announce that I will be sending out, now that we have a policy committee uh, assi assignments, um, I will be sending out some dates for a possible first meeting of that, of that committee. Okay. Is that be a public meeting? Yes. Uh, when will commissioners be apprised of the next meeting date so that we could plan accordingly in case it gets moved to the third and that would be the third of february I actually no then i believe what the intent of the motion was to consult with the okay. uh county supervisors we'll have our next meeting on february 22nd and then we'll come to a decision well, if <laughs> if they agree to the third, I will go ahead and move it to the third. Okay. Uh, I will send them a note tomorrow. Okay. Of the action that was taken and ask if there's if that's possible to do the third third Wednesday. Could you follow up because the sooner we know, the better we can plan our calendars for February. Thank yes, you. I do know that they're both out of town right now, so I don't know how quickly they'll answer back to me. I can't control that, but as soon as I have an answer back from both. Um, yeah, I will inform everyone. I have to put the new set schedule on our website, on our bulletin board, all of those things. Uh, so yes, I will, I will encourage them to answer us quickly. So it could be a matter of a couple of days or next week. Well, we can't go too far. Right. Or we run into, you know, timing issues sure, with sure. notifications and those kind of things. Sure. Yeah. Even though I don't believe we have an annexation or anything on the agenda for, for February. No, we have an MSR that has to be noticed. Yeah, we, that's true. We have an MSR that has to be noticed. Maybe. M Mr. Boyle. Mr. Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got it. No, he's pointing at me because we're the ones holding <laughs> things up. No, but you would, you would file the notes. Yes. Okay. But if it moves up a week, that, that actually means we need to make the note, do the notice like this next week. Yes, exactly. I really appreciate all your efforts. <laughs> yes. Okay. If there is no further business to discuss, then um, we will adjourn in the next scheduled meeting. Depending on our answer from <laughs> the supervisors, will be for February the 15th or February the 22nd. But we're banking on the 15th. Okay. Very good. Meetings adjourned.